Hello and good afternoon. Most welcome to H732. And I will make a lecture inspired of the last couple of days of insights. Uh, what happened is Barbara Tversky sort of opened up a new possibility of thinking all together. It's going into a big hall uh, after being crowded in a small room. And I would like to add, I really wanted to have this lecture somewhere in a bit more nicer place than this crowded little office. Uh, at least the change of pace would have been nice to have it in a pizzeria and then devolved in a pizza or something. Uh, maybe even a glass of uh, some nice drink. But we will do the second best and I will try to be uh, at my... Uh, sharpest because this is very very as we would say in Swedish knifey subject knivit emne and I will make a comparison if you remember about language learning we mentioned a couple of lectures ago I think it was in 710 711 and uh, if I'm gonna make a little recap it was that when we learn languages, rules do not help much. We come to the understanding. They do not aid in the learning. Although they are very interesting and make up for very pe peculiar and uh, good understanding for language, it doesn't actually help with the skill of speaking language and I make a comparison here thanks to Barbara Tversky with philosophy cognition and political theory or whatever you have because the interesting part what has opened up now it's a possibility to take space into all areas it covers everything as long as it's taking uh, its representation from the body and from space and that actually goes with most things so in that circumstance it's incredibly helpful and I will argue in this lecture I'm going to make a very uh, exclusive and fine point not, not something general but it's to help with the understanding and I will try to show that there is a difference in learning theory and learning a skill and that it's not a difference of complete contradiction but is rather a degree. You could see it like a staircase. So instead of making an absolute division between theory and practice, you have to see it as a more progressive. That's my suggestion. And I will go look into that negative or a corrective method not always makes a good sense. And I will start with the latter thing. Uh, two things in the beginning. Uh, the first one is that the difference between theory and learning a skill is a matter of the, the de uh, of degree and not absolute. And the second is that the negative or the corrective method not always makes good sense. Well, I'll start with the latter. And the problem of correction or a negative is that if you say to somebody or think to yourself or read not that that's incorrect the underlying idea is that the contradiction is correct so then you have the positive here 
and here you have the contradiction of that positive. If I say to somebody, don't say like that, the idea is I induce the negative. And this, I will try to show, it's rather problematic, not as straightforward as we usually think. And this actually calls for a live example or something from real life and actually something I'm struggling with right now. Uh, let's start with a corrective phrase. Uh, let's assume that I use the indefinite article uh, a or an or in Swedish et or en or in Greek, where my example is from, mia or enna. Something that is indefinite. And imagine somebody saying, Hans, don't use the indefinite article. It's not correct. And the idea is, then we go to the negative space. This is the indefinite article. And here we have the definite article. This we could call the shadow, the negative space. What is not indefinite article is definite article. That's the idea. They are opposites. But the thing is, it doesn't hold completely true. Because the negative space is not always the definite article. Actually, they are different spaces altogether. And this is a little bit like saying, not an apple. And you want to try to explain what the pear is. Is it helpful? Well, in pedagogy, they think this is helpful. Everybody is aware that it's not correct. But as a crude measure to lead the student into using uh, language and using the indefinite article and the definite article, they can later on make corrections. The idea is sort of steer the student into the right direction, me being the student here. So far, so good. But what the problem is, what I'm hinting to here, and this is a really fine line, it's not a broad gesture I'm going to make, but one could say that the practices are when we speak about indefinite and definite article, not exactly the same. When I say same, they are not of the same nature. And a corrected negative will actually give the impression that are not, is not completely correct. And that impression would be given to the body-mind unity. The body-mind unity, I'm saying because I understand more and more that it's all about action. And what's doing the action? That's the body. So you see, practice and theory go much more closer together than we usually think. It's not really this sure dividing line. And I propose here that this sort of didactic, this pedagogy, can actually be so misleading that it puts the student into the wrong path. Because this is established. The idea that the negative space is a correct space. Not doing the wrong thing is going to put you in the correct face. Not being an apple is going to immediately put the idea of the path.
and you I do understand the idea in pedagogy. I understand that you get a crude picture. I got that when I learned German in school. We got rules that were not correct. Everybody know it. Well, we need to start with something. But I think this is actually a sort of mistake. I'd say it's not optimal. And where have we found this idea before about a homogeneous space? Well, it's of ancient nature. This goes also for knowledge. The idea that the negative space of something is the mirroring image of the positive space needs space to be homogeneous need space to be the same. And this is something I got from the book Barbara Tversky. She shows that space is sort of action. And therefore it's never the same. Because when you speak, when you learn to speak, when you practice, when you do it, when you know it by heart, it will never be the same as the description. Therefore space is not homogeneous. I would even go so far to say those spaces are in essence completely different. There's a great difference. And this is what this language pedagogy I mentioned before is saying. That the things are not as similar as this contradiction thing actually points to. And it can actually, instead of setting you into the general correct uh, direction. You can think of the teacher kicking the student in that direction. I'm going to help him. I think this is unhelpful really because that will establish for the body-mind a completely wrong conception of language and that is that language is completely homogeneous, completely correct in all aspects and that using for some reason, the indefinite article is the contradistinction to definite article. And by making that, we unlearn, we take away knowledge, we put language into a format that's not correct. Language doesn't have homogeneous space. And actually, the problem is twofold. And this is especially apparent in language learning, but I propose it also applies to a degree to other areas, possibly even all other areas. And what we are doing here, we're putting a distance between us and the language, and therefore we can start to speak about contradictions. If you see something from afar, everything starts to look the same. And if you have sameness, you can also have contradiction. You have a clear-cut difference between positive space and a negative space. If you go further close, you will see that that's not possible. You cannot have categories on a very close level. The second thing is also pertinent, or that is that the corrective mentality in itself will make you unduly self-aware. And therefore, in the end, when it comes to action, because this is action to, to speak is to do something, it will make you uncertain when you're trying to perform. And this tendency is exactly this reflective consciousness, this unnecessary self-awareness, that in the end, when I'm standing 
for instance, uh, in a market, and I want to use the definite or the indefinite article, the teacher has told me, that's wrong, Hans, don't use that. That could actually put me off when I'm supposed to do it. This self-awareness of me being faulty before is making me unduly self-aware. And when it comes to performance, any thinking about what I'm supposed to do will hinder me. And this is exactly the same thing as when I'm supposed to uh, kick a football or do something other that takes precision. If the idea that I could be wrong occurs in my mind, that will put me off the actual action. One could say I get a little tiny bit nervous, but that's enough to throw me off doing the correct things. And that was the point of this language learning that we understand now, that the rules are a little bit, to a small extent, a teacher shouting at you, don't do that. It makes you self-aware, uncertain, and you lose a little bit of the intention. This freedom, this happiness of using it voluntarily, it becomes restrictive rules. And I would say, on a very sublime level, this also applies to incredibly abstract thinking really theoretical learning. And this obviously is one of my more bold claims today, That's maybe the boldest claim. Uh, but I do think that this performance fright, as I would call it, that uh, uh, anxiousness, but to a very low level, can get into thinking when we really need it. One obvious case to help my point of view is chess games. We all know that the tiniest little bit of nervousness will put you off. And if this Kasparov and Kortnoy going together, we know the partners try to make the other side more nervous in some ways. Acting intimidating, trying to look right through the person, saying things beforehand at the press conference that will intimidate the person, saying they are going to win and such stuff. And that is actually very decisive. And this is one of the reasons people can't do that anymore, because it influences so much. Actually, they're not allowed even to put faces to the other person, because that has an intimidating effect. But think of this. And this is a very famous thing that actually happened, and that's Niels Bohr in Solvay in Brussels. When he had discussions with Einstein, and Einstein had been incredibly intelligent, he put forward an example that proved that quantum physics, as Niels Bohr perceived it, was completely wrong. And this is not only evidence on paper, it's also not a little bit intimidating. You have to imagine there were a lot of people there as well. And all the newspapers were in Brussels at that time, at Solvay conferences. They know about that. So you can imagine the pressure that was on Niels Bohr in front of his colleagues, but maybe even in front of his whole research. Everything was in peril. And even if that would not have been the case, even if it would have been completely calm, even a little hint of being anxious when you get to that level of abstraction has effects. This is what we see in chess. We also see it uh, when people do terribly complicated thinking. They say in CERN, for instance, even a drop of a pen can throw somebody off for good. When you come to the specific thinking, it's extra necessary, I would say even, that you are at your best. And Niels Bohr managed to keep calm to 
the deepest level so his thinking could be used and this is what I mean by thinking action in the same way your steadiness and your confidence when you throw a dart or you shoot an arrow the thinking is similar it's almost the same thing it's an act it's a muscular act and do you have any doubt whatsoever when you go to do this that will have an effect it will not open up the thinking so you can think freely as long as you feel even little pressed it will disappear he remarked later if it had not happened then because it did happen in Solvay something remarkable happened he worked all night together with his uh, doctors his students and somewhere he came up with a solution and he said later if I had not come up with that that night in Solvay it would never have happened because everything looks so fantastically easy afterwards when we look at it in hindsight everything bears to logic all actual explorations all inventions everything that human beings have done that uh, was caused by creativity looks completely obvious in hindsight but at the very point, it's not. And I mentioned this before. Here, of course, this problem with ex posteriori and ex anteriori come in. Afterwards, it's so easy to explain what you do. So easy to explain all the inventions. Why do we have uh, the weed? Yeah, it's so easy. Why didn't they invent it before? Why didn't the Incas have the weed? They never invented it. They had a whole civilization without the weed. So somebody need to invent things. And this bears also indirectly shows that the idea that all inventions explorations uh, research are necessary from the beginning because it looks like that in hindsight ex posteriori because you can always well, it's not a problem uh, discovering penicillin I'm just uh, I'm just gonna leave the bra for a couple of days and then I put in bacteria test it's obvious well I know that now Alexander Fleming didn't know that the, the invention that saved at least 20 million people's life in the Second World War and in the time between could, might as well not have happened. Not at all. And with quantum physics, at least Niels Bohr is sure, if he hadn't done that then, it's not certain that it would ever happen. And I think the educational system unintentionally, not with intention, but unintentionally by giving you so much sustenance for thinking, they give you all this old knowledge, like 10,000 books piled on top of each other. It's so easy to think that was already settled from the beginning because you leave, start to live in a world that everything is already there do you pair this with the Socratic thinking of uh, uh, the maiotic uh, that truth is somewhere there constantly yes you do it gets even stronger and uh, here I'm going to be very decisive in, in the other things I'm going to say I make a claim but I would say it's patently wrong to say those things and it leads to absurdity. In the end, you have to say, well, it was necessary for uh, Da Vinci to paint Mona Lisa. That would have happened sooner or later. And if not Da Vinci, somebody else would have painted Mona Lisa. It's bound to happen. And then all art like Bach is bound to happen, and Mozart is bound to happen. The exploration into uh, the South Sea or discovery of Australia all that needed to be happening 
because it looks like that in hindsight. It's completely wrong. It's, it's a misconception of the whole world. And of course, this is leading to other problems I won't mention today. I'm just going to whisper them determinism. <laughs> <laughs> there is a whole heap of problems. But we make a terrible mistake there. Because actually, the now and the future is absolutely open. And therefore, having an, a mind that's not having any rules is extremely important because then you are free to do your best. Because if you feel corrected too much, you, you don't have that liberty anymore. You get rules in your head and you get restricted. And we all know how that restriction looks like. This is a hunchback from school. A student that been told too many times by his teacher, don't do that, don't do this. This is an exaggeration, but I would say to a very small scale, this happened with this. It's a rule. And in the end, these rules applied before you learn something can have, and then I say only can, and I say can have uh, an effect that is actually detrimental to the thing you want to do. No, to conclude, not all space are equal, and that goes for space as we normally perceive it. And we talked about that loads of times. We talked about that possibly 400 times, that Newton wanted to have a homogeneous space, and Leibniz thought it was an aberration, uh, which it is, of course. Uh, Newton himself didn't believe in it. But it goes for knowledge too. And this is what Tversky showed me. Knowledge is a similar space. More or less is the same space. And this space is not homogeneous either. It's different. It has its own essence. Learning the indefinite article in Greek is a completely different skill from learning the definite article. It's two different things. It's like uh, learning to use your knife and your fork when eating. Two different things. They don't do the same. The knife is carving, the, the, the fork is holding the things. Well, they're both on the plate. Yes, so far it's correct. They're both in combination with eating. You usually don't use your fork to other things, like scratch your hair, you're not supposed to do that. But that's the only closeness. So I would say it's a complete fall to learn this, and I'm trying to take that learning away because it's already established in my head with the definite and definite article. I came to so many paradoxes and that led me to, to this idea. And also another thing that's a completely unconscious, not caused by teachers or the educational system, but I'm using the relationship between indefinite articles and definite articles in my own language. And that's another problem. And this is not to blame the educational system. But if I have this idea, you see now, if I have this idea, that's enough to put me in the direction of using my own language like that. And to think, hmm, well, I'm going to use my own language. I don't, I, obviously you don't think this verbally in your head, but you do it in your body mind. You think, yeah, yeah, that, I've already done that. I can admit, I've already stopped thinking that in, in Greek. It, it, maybe even two years ago when I had no idea about Greek. But it was the first I, idea I had that N is, yeah, that's probably like N. <laughs> that's how we human beings work. And me, yeah, that's probably et then. And I had no about Greek. Uh, at that instance, I didn't even know they had three genders. So that makes it even more wrong. But it sounded that way, because I usually only heard two. Well, I did hear the other one, but that sounds so different, so I ignored it. Uh, but this goes to show that this is not always the best path to be taken. Some instance, yes, contradictions we cannot live without, and we should use them. But we should not use them all the time. That's exactly the same thing. Don't be terrified now when I say we shouldn't use it all the time. But it's, you always 
you already do that. You don't put ketchup on all your food. You don't put it on sandwiches. You put it on spaghetti or concrete or something like that. You already have that rules to yourself in different circumstances. So it's not that odd. Contradictions are not always the same. A pear is not a contradiction to an apple. Yes, in some cases it could be. I admit, you can have a box and for some reasons you only bought apples and pears. And then in that box you can say it's a contradiction. And that could help uh, somebody else I say, don't take the apples. That would be actually understandable in this specific case. This specific case. But you cannot use it always. You, because there is a reality and the reality is not homogeneous. And especially when you start thinking that words are action in some way. All actions are different. I do different things with my hands all the time. Not a singular action I do is similar. I can't use the action I use to put my rucksack on to use for this device. It doesn't happen. Look, my hands are moving in a different way. Barbara Tversky shows us hand movement, body movements is where it starts. It's not something separable. We are not moving our bodies in some other universe. We do it here. And it goes to say it actually has a purpose. Well, I think that's, I have to put Barbara Twersky away now for a while. But I'm afraid she's coming back a little bit in 733. Uh, because Kali really begged me yesterday. It's his fault. He wants to hear what Barbara Twersky says about Sora too. And that I'm trying to go. But after that, I will leave Barbara Twersky. And I say thank you very much and thank you much for listening. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you.